This is Ahead in Tech with me, your host, Sanjay Puswani. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here today with Kevon Chung. Kevon, hello. How are you? Hi, I'm really good, Sanjay. Good morning here. Good morning, indeed. The weather is terrible here, though, isn't it? Unfortunately. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, well, we'll try and make up for it with some bright conversation. Uh, Kevon, you're really quite entrepreneurial and you're relatively quite young and you've achieved quite a lot of in, in your life. Um, after university, you start your own company and then you go to developer bootcamp. This is back in 2013 or 12 or something like that. So you must be very ahead of the curve. That would have been one of the first cohorts, right? Um, you then work as a developer, I guess, to pick up some tech skills. Then you uh, have your own startup again, uh, and uh, you exit that, uh, and now you're kind of evangelizing this building in public movement, and uh, you're you're really going all in on this. So we're, we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be touching on um, uh, your bootcamp experience, uh, your startup, and why and how you exit. And we're gonna we'll, we're gonna focus on the building in public. Yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about everything. Okay, awesome. I'm really excited. I've been really looking forward to this one. Um, and you're, you're a very interesting, uh, young man. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, the journey has been a roller coaster up and down, but definitely a tons of sharing that I can, I can give it to your audience. So I'm looking forward to telling more of the stories. Yeah. Fantastic. And that's definitely prophesizing the latter half of our conversation. Cause you're very much about sharing. Yeah. So I want to try and understand you a little bit more. So, okay. Take me through this boot camp process. How do you sort of, how and when do you f uh, first discover it? Um, why, or what takes you there and what's your experience there like? Okay, sure. So when I went to college, I actually majored in business and finance, just like most of the people here in Hong Kong. <laughs> so what I was thinking about is, oh, I didn't want to get into finance after I graduated because it's not fun to me. So at that moment, I think right before my graduation, I was thinking to myself, hey, Kevon, what, what do you really want to do in your life? And I, one of the tricks that I did was thinking back to my teenage age, like 12 years old, 13 years old, where did I spend my time? And I was basically the kid who finished school, ran home, spent all my time on the internet. And I was making websites and I have thousands of members on my forums. So that was my passion. I was not bored at it and I was learning every single day. So that was the moment when I knew I had to jump into tech because it's something that I, I just love so much. But um, because I didn't major in computer science, right? So I knew how to make website, but it's just like the service layer. I didn't know the coding uh, behind it. So I think about one year, I think nine months or one year after I graduated, I had another failure of a startup experience. So I was thinking to myself, well, I cannot not know how to code if I want to be in tech. That's when I decided to, let's just be my own tech technical co-founder. So I went to the bootcamp. I see. So uh, that brings me up to your motivation, I guess, which is quite similar to um, a lot of people who go to boot camps, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what's your experience there like? Was it what you expected? Were you good at it? So it, it was funny because the, the students, uh, the knowledge spectrum is pretty wide. Like I am someone who I started making website when I was 12 and I self-studied coding for half a year before I went to a bootcamp. So I was definitely pretty ready. <laughs> I knew mm. that. But there are also people who uh, jump into the classes because they heard that coding can open up a lot of opportunities. So you can see like everyone is at a different place going in. Um, but for me, I, I was ready. I knew it was something that I want. And for me, it was kind of a shift from an individual learning mode, like just self-studying at home, which is not fun. Like I, I didn't really learn a lot to a student, like a cohort based learning environment where I can work on projects with my, 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 my classmates. And that was really fun. And my learning just like took a huge jump. And that's explained why I got a job right after the bootcamp as a software engineer. And you went to a general assembly in the US, right? That's right. I flew back. Sorry, can you hear my baby crying? I, I can, but that's perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I did. I was back in Hong Kong, but then I was like, I need to do it now. 
I, I'm not waiting for General Assembly to come to Hong Kong, which they did about a year later, but I couldn't wait. So I was like, let me buy the ticket and fly to New York for that. Wow, that's amazing. But you, I mean, you had had previous experience in the US. You weren't, it was, you weren't a complete stranger to the States, right? Right. I mean, I, I went to the States at 15. Uh, I still remember I hopped on the plane all by myself. Uh, my family didn't travel with me. So I went into the gate and I was like crying by myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I spent seven years in Boston um, for boarding school and college. I, I suppose your boot camp experience, I mean, I'm taking away that it was a good one. They did a good job and there was good career support or am I wrong there? Um, I, I think pretty good job in general, because as you can imagine, 2013, it was, I think the second year or first year that coding bootcamp really started mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. So no one really knew how to do it, but uh, they put together a pretty good instructor team. And I definitely learned a lot um, in terms of the support after the program. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a bit unfortunate because I'm not a US citizen. So I knew it would be very hard for me to get a job there. So I didn't really try <laughs> to find one there. I mm -hmm. just flew back to Asia and started to look for opportunities over here. Great. And uh, we know that worked out very well for you because you did get a developer job pretty quickly after that, I understand, in, in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't know if it's about me, but demand for programmers are just like crazy at that time. So I think if you know some kind of coding, it's not that hard to find a job at that point. So I was a bit lucky to find something in Singapore. And I, again, I hop on the plane in three <laughs> days and then I move over there. That's amazing. I mean, you're very brave. You just go wherever you want. I, I, that, that's the good thing about being young, right? You just yeah. got to, you, you can do something like that. And now you've got a baby to look after, which by the way, if you need to go look after it, it's no problem. We can pause. Just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I have a pretty good support system here. So uh, yeah, things has been pretty good. Tell me about your startup. I, I, I only know a very little bit about this. And it seems like a very interesting story. So tell me about the very beginning of it and uh, what happens with it then? Right before this startup, which we were, we were talking about like Toasty for the last two years, uh, previously I had a bit of startup experience as well. I partnered up with a business partner and we ran a coding school. I was there for four years. So we were expanding a kids coding school uh, where we bring in students to offline classes and they come into our campus and we teach them. So I sort of get a sense of how to build up a business, but not, not a software business. So in the last two years, what I've been working on is a startup called Toasty. I, because of my experience, I was able to uh, get connected with a very passionate investor who wanted to get into tech, uh, but didn't have the knowledge. So we pair up, he provides the capital and I basically run the company. And we, we, we started off with a bit of funding. So that, that was a bit of uh, a very dangerous path to all the entrepreneurs out there. Because with money, what I did was I built a team. I had a CTO, I have a head of product, I have engineers and designers. In, in very quickly, we grew the team to like six to eight people. And with people, what do you do? You have to keep them busy, right? So we decided to jump into building the product within the first 30 days, basically. And as you can imagine, we didn't have a very good understanding of the space. We were, we were starting in the uh, live event space to build interactive technology to kind of mobilize the 60, 80 people in the room. And then because of COVID, we had to move the technology online and somehow we are in this virtual event space and that uh, virtual event and meeting space. And what, and when that happened, we were basically always looking for the right problems to solve when we already have the product. So it was just a very difficult path in general um, because we didn't really understand the, the pain point behind it. So yeah, at the end of 2020, I decided to kind of step back from the company and went on what you're seeing right now, a content creator journey. You actually exited that startup. Uh, right. no. no, no, is it, no, is it I, I, is I left the team. Okay. Yeah, I see. It's I left still the going. Team. Yeah. It's still going. 
I mean, there was a story there about uh, I guess your your founders, right? Or sorry, your 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 investors, right? Yeah. Because then you had to kind of explain to them why you're exiting, and then what do they do? Do they do they retain control of the company and just put someone new in? I, I was a very transparent type of person, so when I saw that I wasn't able to bring the company forward to hit our growth trajectory, um, and things are not going. And I knew that in the next six to twelve months, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a huge change. I was honest to the investor, and I told him that, and he was being really open as well. He's like, he like basically he understand this is all about startup. Like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It sometimes it's not something you can control. So we basically agree that I would just step away, and the CTO would take over and try to kind of continue to seek. Out where we fit in the market, so the company is still going, and so a lot of people tell me that oh, Kavan, that's a very noble thing to do, to be able to step away. But to be honest, I think it's just it's just a very conscious decision on my part because I was I was in a lot of pain、uh, trying to figure out, and sometimes you just cannot like with, sometimes you're at a spot, and no matter what you do, you just cannot like. Get out from that trap, and I was in that spot. So I don't think it's very noble. It's just a very, it's just a decision to save myself, basically. And I mean, you have to take that decision, right? It's a difficult one to take, but you can't overlook it, right? It, it's not like I wake up one day and I want to do it. It's something that drags on for months. So, so at some point, I just feel like, okay, it makes sense for me to move on. What what were the I guess the personal feelings that you were having at the time that made you want to move on, or why you weren't enjoying this? Okay, we're talking about lessons learned here, right?、Yeah. So I think I took a wrong direction towards building the company.、Um, now that I'm able to step back, I actually enjoy very much that I start things very small, and I'm able to get like twenty fans around me and who really enjoy my offering. And I continue to discover how I can help them further.、Uh, back then, at the startup, I was taking a very different approach. I was going building the team. I was going building the product first, and then we were trying to seek out customers. And of course, we we have fans who really love our product, but it's not enough. Like it's better to take baby steps so that the momentum is building up instead of. Having a big product and then try to look at which market fits you. So I think it's more the approach、uh, was 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 wrong. Yeah. Right. Right. And I mean that's fair enough, right? Like like you say, you have to have learnings, right? And you have to grow. You have to make mistakes to get there, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big believer that、um, if I face a critical decision, I always pick the path that is more uncomfortable because my thinking is. No matter what happened, I'm gonna grow a lot if I take that path.、Mm. So, so with that thinking, I'm not like super frustrated. It's all just part of the journey. So it's it's all pretty good as it turns out. Yeah, that's given me great deja vu because I read your newsletter this morning, which you put out <laughs> every week, and you talk about just that, and it was really inspiring. I think it's an important point to make that.、Um, And you you said in your new newsletter that、um, you'll always pick、uh, the most difficult path because I suppose reading between the lines your your、uh, your journey doesn't end with success your journey ends with、uh, growth and with learning and by choosing a lot of things that are very difficult for you to do you give yourself more opportunities to grow right and discover new things exactly totally I think I think you summarize it really well. Where, where, how can people sign up to your newsletter? It's not bad. I mean, you know, I really like the fact that you know it doesn't take long and it's very. It doesn't drag me away from everything. You just kind of、uh, give me short, sharp bursts of you know what you've been up to that week and your 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 knowledge, I guess. Thank you. I think people can just go to my website,、uh, kavonchering dot com, and then there's like a newsletter button at top right, so they can check it out. Okay, cool. And、uh, they can find you on Twitter as well,、uh, as well at uh, uh, at Meet Kavon. Is that right? Meet Kavon. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm more active on Twitter than other platforms. Yep, and we're going to discover that in just a second. You seem to be the, the king of Twitter <laughs>、okay. at the moment. No, no, I'm just learning my 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 thing slowly. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I love how everything's coming together in your life, you know, and you're very, you, you know what you're doing and you're very clear on who you are, which I think is the important part. I, th I, th I think so. I was just at dinner with a friend last night and he was asking me, hey, Kavon, how, how do you find out that you, you, you are suitable to run a course like what you're doing right now how, in a community? And I was telling him that I don't know. It just sort of come together. Like my experience is education, a bit of technical background. And uh, when I was running the, uh, the last startup, I was doing a lot of community work. Every week I had a call with all our users and I would be hosting 15 people at a time. So all of this brings back to what I'm doing right now, running a course, uh, gathering people together and helping them. I don't know how that happened. And I, I guess it will, it will happen for everyone. Like all your experiences will at some point merge together and help you go for your next step. So yeah, it's grateful about that. Absolutely. Uh, and it's great that you're grateful. And uh, yeah, uh, people will be very lucky to follow that path in life. Not everyone gets the opportunity, right? That, that's true, yeah. If you've been enjoying this podcast, you should definitely check out Enormous Issues, Audacious Ideas, a podcast from tech co-founder and friend of mine, Ria Naidu, on a mission to change the world by developing world-changing entrepreneurs if you're interested in tech trends that are shifting the world as we know it and hearing from mission-driven leaders that are absolutely changing the game, go ahead and search for Enormous Issues, Audacious Ideas, wherever you get your podcasts, or follow Ria on Instagram at Audacious Ideas. Cool. So we're segueing wonderfully into what you're doing now, which is bu <laughs> building in public. So give me give me a quick introduction first before uh, we dive into a lot of the, the granular detail. What is building in public? So in the traditional business way, we talk about marketing, right? Everyone wants to do marketing. And in, in the old days, the marketing stories are always polished up. It's always the perfect story. Oh, like you get good looking people on the advertisement. Like you always talk about the good stuff. But building in public emerged in the last, it, it has been around for some time, maybe like the last decade which means we're sharing a lot of behind the scenes, the, the pain, the struggle, the lesson learned of our journey. And it's not just the good stuff. We're also sharing the, the, the struggles, but then we always tell people how we can turn that over into a good lesson learned. And when I'm learning that, I'm sure someone else is also learning the same. So you're using your journey in a very authentic way to grow an audience around you. And what you can do is with an audience around you, when you're building your next feature, you can ask them when you are, I don't know, when you have like a new campaign and you need some early tester, you can ask them, you can grab them. So basically you can do everything when people are around you. So it's a very, very authentic way of growing an audience. And I just love it so much because it resonates with my personal value. It is actually quite a powerful technique. It's kind of a strategy. It's kind of it's kind of a guide on how to grow communities and grow successful businesses. And I think there's quite a lot to it. And we'll hopefully be able to dive into all those depths uh, uh, right now. But, yeah. So now that we understand briefly what it is, take me to the beginning. When do you first discover it? And what draws you in? What are your first experiences? My first experience was uh, about six months ago, end of 2020. I left the startup and I was basically taking some time off because I was expecting a newborn. I basically started writing a lot. I put together all my failures, struggles from the last startup as we talked about that. Um, and I put it into my blog and I share it on Twitter every single week. And what happened was that people are reading my sharing and they are resonating with it and they tell me they really like it. So I sort of discovered this little thing about, oh, wow, when I'm being authentic, people actually want to hear more. And I didn't know about that, but it was fascinating. And for me personally, I wanted to do more than just writing blog posts because I also need to figure out my, my own journey. So I decided to look around for what is a topic that I can dive deeper to kind of help other people out there. And that's when I discovered the term building in public. And it's basically what I have been doing and what I believe in. But the, 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 
the nice thing about that is people want to do it, but when I Google building in public, I don't see any resources telling people um, how to do it, guiding people through the process. I find like three blog posts and that's about it. So I decided to write a guide, nine chapters. I think it's 10,000 words. Yeah, and I spent two months writing the guide and it, it was very well received. Like people just tell me that they are reading it every single week just to reinforce the learning. So that was pretty much how I got started with this whole movement. And the very high level overview of it is it's kind of a pathway you can follow, like a, a set, almost a set of instructions, like a, a strategy for you to take and then make authentic yourself to allow you to build a community and form a grassroots movement around something you're trying to start. Exactly. Um, the guide covers things like, why do you need to build in public? How do you write engaging tweet threads or tweets? Or how do you write good blog posts, something like that. So it's pretty much a guide to give you a jump start into this whole movement. Where do you get your information to write this guide? I mean, was there, were there resources out there? I know it was kind of a little bit on indie hackers, which has really come a long way now. And, you know, the building in public on indie hackers is quite, quite big as well. But at that point in time, what, where were you getting your inf information or inspiration from? So there weren't a lot of resources out there. That's why I was creating it. But I took a very different approach to how people usually create this type of product. I, I still remember when I first tweeted about it, I only had the idea of creating this guy. I had nothing. I don't even have the outline, but I was putting it out there. Hey guys, I'm going to create a building in public guide. And this is the step that I'm going to take. So I just put myself out there. And I also talk about my process to research about this topic. Obviously, I got into this topic with some of my own knowledge, but it's not enough. I'm, I mean, I need to create what's out there as well. So I develop a process of visiting IndieHacker.com because they have a group dedicated to building in public. So I was spending, I think, an hour each day in the forum, just helping people out. So in that way, I really get what people are wondering about, why they need help, what they're confused about building in public. And I just keep taking notes on my notepad. And I have all these talking points here and there. I don't care how, how they look at the moment. I just dump all the ideas in there. And I think I took a weekend to look at all my notes and figure out, okay, wow, there's a theme that emerged from all these talking points. So I start mapping them out and that eventually become the chapters of their guide. And through this whole process, I was updating my Twitter audience, which I didn't have a huge one back then. Um, I was just keep, I was updating them how I'm going to write this guide. And I think after two weeks, I still haven't had anything published, but people are already like quite excited about it. That's great. And that's a fantastic process you kind of went through. Was that, I mean, it's like you kind of identified lots of little uh, micro pain points and then you came up with a solution that answered all of them. Was that like a conscious process for you or did you kind of just fall into that? that that's how it happened. Remember how I told you for the last startup, we went in building the product without <laughs> understanding the pain. Yeah. That was my biggest learning. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't want to do it again. So now I'm going to take it slow and fully understand what, why people need it. Then I build it. Yeah. You know, you should be a mentor. <laughs> I mean, I, I help people as much as I can, but I wouldn't slap on the word like mentor. Yeah. It's just too, too much, too much pressure. Yeah, I guess, I guess I, I always like to keep a learner mindset. Like even though I'm running a community, like with 20, 30 people right now, I still tell them, Hey, I'm just a few steps ahead of you. I'm not an expert here, uh, but I'll share everything I learned with all of you. And we're going to do this together. I, I like to position myself this way because one, I'm not setting the wrong expectation and two, just like to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a great position you fill there because you're kind of a, a fantastic guide, right? You're not like a hero for people to like follow, but you're, you're a guide to help show people the way, right? You can say that. Yeah. And a lot of people, when they first jump onto the internet, 
they feel like they need to be the hero in order to teach people stuff. But I realize it's not. You can just, people actually like to follow people who are just a few steps ahead of them because it's more relatable. The, the tips are more practical. If they're looking for someone with 20,000 followers, I don't think they can get a lot from, from a person like that. That's what they told me, actually. Before um, uh, you tell me about, um, I guess, some of the intricacies of how you build in public, what, what it actually is, can you sell me on it? What are the benefits? Building in public is basically content creation, right? You are able to document your journey. For example, Sanjay, you're building this podcast. Right now, I don't know actually, but the most straightforward way is you produce one podcast and then you put it out there. But if you look at it from a building in public stand of point, you can actually start talking about this podcast that you're doing with Kavan Me. Wait, like when you first schedule the call and give people a taste of like who Kavan is. And then a week later, share maybe three things that Kavan stand for. And then you can talk a little bit about your production uh, method. How do you make it so seamless? How do you edit the video? All of this are actually content that are interesting to your audience. So instead of just one piece of information for your audience, which is the launch of the podcast, you are now having 15 different angles to share with your audience and imagine how interesting that would be for your audience to read it. It's not like, oh, there's a new podcast out. It's so, so consistent, so, so constant. Now, wow, I'm learning how Sanjay thinks about interviewing people. Oh, this is why Sanjay doesn't care about this. This is why Sanjay cares about that. Those are, inf those are all connection points that build trust between you and your audience. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful engine of doing marketing or community engagement. Okay, so- Are you so sold? I'm 100% sold. <laughs> those, those are fantastic ideas. Instead of my mentor, maybe you could be my manager. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can be buddies. <laughs> okay, you got it, buddy. <laughs> you keep dropping wonderful knowledge like that and we can be buddies as long as you like. <laughs> No, yeah, I'm sold and hopefully other people are sold as well because this really is a strategy that can lead to amazing community growth and, and engagement. So now explain to me some of the key sort of steps to the strategy. I think the first thing that people struggle with because building in public is writing a lot of content. So a lot of people are good builders, but they're not good storyteller. So the most important part is figure out a system so that you can tell the story consistently. So for example, let's, let's take you as an example, Sanjay. Uh, the first thing you should do is create a system so that you can dump ideas anytime. Because when you're running outdoor, when you're taking a shower, ideas come in, right? So you need to find a tool. I don't care if you use Notion, Google Doc, or like Evernote, whatever. Have a place where you can so easily dump all the ideas there. So when you think about, oh, I'm going to find a guy like Kavan, put it down and block out a time early in the week so that you can look at that list and think about, okay, what are some important lessons that I can kind of elaborate on and share with my audience and write a tweet threads or blog post about it. So you block out maybe an hour Monday to do that. And in that hour, basically you outline all the things you want to talk about in bullet points. Don't care about grammar. Don't care about writing. Just outline them. And then maybe later in the week, Wednesday or Thursday, take the outline and expand it into the final product, a blog post or a tweet thread, or even a video. I don't care. In, if you have this system set up, you're basically documenting your building journey every single week, and you're sharing a lot to your public. And a lot of people are afraid, like, can I come up with a lot of ideas to talk about? You cannot if you don't have a system like this. But with a system like this, it's so easy. It's no brainer. So I think this would be the first step to do. Hey, you. Yeah, you watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Just wanted to say thank you. You're the reason I'm creating this content and your opinion is really important to me. So I hope you're enjoying it. 
One of the best feelings is hearing from my audience, so please let me know what you like or don't like or whatever else you want to say. You can leave a comment below, tweet me at Ahead and Tech, or find lots of other ways to contact me on my site at aheadandtech.com. You can also really help me grow by liking, sharing, or telling a friend. Thank you again, and back to the show. And storytelling is a large part of it as well, yeah. right? There's, there's a lot of advice on how to craft uh, engaging stories. Yeah, I mean, because I mostly guide people to write tweet threads. So it's a very unique piece of storytelling technique. For example, the first tweet, the first line is basically the most important because you want to hold people's attention in. And then how long do you want to write a thread? I think I have one member who told me that his thread is 33 tweets together. And most of us are like, no, that's too long. No one is going to read it. So a lot of little techniques here and there that we can, we can uh, implement to make, to, make, to make it appealing for people to read it. And I suppose the bulk of the rest of, I keep calling it strategy. I hope that's, uh, it's not wrong of me to call it that. Um, but the, the bulk of the rest of it, I suppose, is in managing your community and growing it and uh, retaining engagement? Honestly, I like to call it a strategy because I can feel that a lot of people are jumping into building in public because it's a nice buzzword or a trend, but they don't think about why they do it. And I like to call it strategy because when you figure out how building in public is part of your business, you are going to do it sustainably. You're going to do it consistently. And that's the reason why people don't stop doing it. A lot of people actually like try for two months and then they give up. It's because they don't incorporate into their core strategy. So we have been talking a lot about sharing stories, the behind the scenes story, right? So that's the first step to grow an audience around you. The second step would be to keep them engaged. So you're constantly talking about your journey. Uh, if you don't talk about it for a few weeks, people are going to, uh, not follow you, right? So you have to keep doing it. But the other key part is how do you funnel these interests into your products? So for me, I talked about my marketing funnel, like building in public is my top funnel. So it comes from Twitter. And then I bring people to my newsletter, blog post, and my free resources, like the making Twitter friends email course. Mm. And then people learn about Kavan a little bit more. And then they go into my paid products and th that is the paid community and the 30 days in public challenge. So people also need to be a bit strategic about thinking how people can, you know, get to learn more about what you do, not mm. just like keep talking on Twitter without thinking yeah, what, yeah. what your goal is. Absolutely. And that's what I love that there is a very well-defined goal. That's always kind of like the North star that to you're always following as you're going along this path. Yeah, I think it, it, it keeps me focused so that I can do it every week. But what are the common misconceptions that people have? Because you don't actually have to do absolutely everything. There could be some things that people are um, uncomfortable with sharing, right? That's exactly the biggest misconception is a lot of people think, oh, building in public, I have to share 100%. No, you don't, you don't have to. If you're not comfortable with your revenue numbers, you don't have to share that. If you're not comfortable with even sharing your traffic information, how many subscribers you have in your newsletter, don't. The, the key is we're, we're just trying to be authentic, right? And everyone has a different fine line of how authentic they want to be. So I think the number one step is find that line that you feel comfortable with and just stay within your zone for a little bit. You, until one day that you're comfortable uh, sharing the numbers, then you do it. To be very honest, like I have been debating with myself whether I want to share my uh, monthly revenue number. I decided not to yet because it's just so small that, <laughs> that people might think, oh, well, Kavan, you're doing so much, but you're not making a lot. So mm. that might hurt my image, right? So why would I do that? I'm not doing that. And the second thing is, in the early stage of building a product, um, I'll be honest, we give away some, some uh, we give away for free sometimes. And that is gonna trigger some emotions for the people who actually pay for it. So I don't wanna do that. 
But when I grow to a certain size, and those figures become a bit more vague, like no one knows who pay how much, then I'm okay with it. So just find that line and then stick to what you're comfortable in. Mm. Um, so that that's the biggest misconception. But another thing that people say a lot is they feel like building in public is a lot of bragging. Like I'm always talking about myself. Um, I'm I'm telling people how much I make. I'm telling people how many new users I get last week. And I would tell them, yes, a part of it is to promote yourself and you should do it because if you don't promote yourself, no one will. But again, if you're only doing this, then yes, you are, uh, you're, you're a bragger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you just look at that as maybe 5% of your whole storytelling and all the 95% are struggles, mistakes, lesson learned, then you build up trust with your audience. And even though you talk about your wins for 5%, people are okay with it. In fact, if you go onto Twitter, when you celebrate wins, your audience, because they have trust in you, they celebrate with you. So that's how powerful it is. When they celebrate with you, more people see it. So, so it's, it's a win-win, but just don't focus on sharing wins 100% of the time. Where is this movement going now? Is there like a V2 of building in public? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure because um, right now I think building in public is nice because it's a big differentiation. Not a lot of people are doing it. So when you do it, you're quite unique in your way and you can win some hearts with your authenticity. But as you can imagine with everything, when more people do it, it becomes saturated. Mm. Let, let's take a moment to imagine if every single person is building in public, then the people who are sharing deeper lesson learned will win more hearts versus people who are just sharing things that everyone knows already. And they're just sharing it for the sake of sharing it. So I think on one hand, um, you have to do a better job to stand out when this movement keeps going forward. But on the other hand, we are all sharing our personal journey, right? So in a way it's very unique. As long as you stay true to yourself, no one can copy you. Like it's, it's so unique to your own learning and experience and journey. So I'm, I'm a, a bit in a debate where it can go it can, it, it can fall, but it can stay as very unique. So I'm not sure where this is going. But at the end of the day, what I learned so far is if you're you, if you're not pretending to be someone, it can go forever. Now, you know, I see you as one of the people who's kind of advancing this movement in a really big way. You know, you've taken up the mantle more so than anyone else I can, I can see anyway. So, you know, in a sense, you're kind of determining to an extent the future of this movement. So where, <laughs> where, where would you personally like to see it go? Well, I definitely want to see more people do it because it's, it's still, to, to a lot of people, it's still unknown, like why they should build in public, right? The, the why, like you asked me just now, the why is still very unclear. But I think being authentic is really a way of living. Like a lot of people say like B2B business, business to business, but at the, other, at the end of the day, we're humans. So it really should be H to H, human <laughs> yeah. to human. Yeah. And I don't really get why would you do, why would you approach something differently just because you are selling your work in business? I don't get that. So mm. to me, my, my, my dream is that more people will be more authentic and still make a good living doing that. And the world will become a very happy place. Uh, I think we touched on the course that you're running, which is uh, 30 days of building in public. And this yeah. is, that's actually a V2 of the course, right? There was a V1 before that, right? Yeah. So uh, next week I'm running cohort number two and I, I took it very slowly. So cohort one started like two weeks ago and I was basically test running it. I, so I'll, I'll tell you the backstory. I started out with the private community. I thought I could just create something that people can join and then they can come for help if they need help with building in public. 
But when I'm observing my members, how they interact with each other, how they are um, going onto the community, nothing much is happening. And I was asking myself, is community the right way to guide people in building in public? And it, as it turns out, I think it's not. Building in public is more like a mindset shift. So it's more important that I have something more concrete to push people to do it. And that is why I created a second product, which is the 30 days in public. So that in 30 days, I'm going to push you. <laughs> I'm going to put you into groups so that you're going to do a lot in that 30 days. So it's a very slow process for me to discover the needs of people and to create the right product. And I'm still fine tuning uh, the program as we speak, uh, but I'm excited because I don't know. I just love tuning the product and never say that it's a finished product. Can you tell me about some of the other courses you're running? Because it's like, it seems like you seem to be um, coming out with a new course just about every other week right now. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I need you to stop because I want to do all of them. I don't have time. <laughs> no, I mean, um, I had a course called Making Twitter Friends. It's free. Um, so if, if someone comes from a marketing background, they would know that a free course is more like a top funnel to get people in. And then the 30 days in public is pretty much my main offering. Like, I think I'm going to stick to this for a while because it's still early days. It's still cohort two. I have a lot of room to make it better. And there are still a lot of people who can benefit from this. And this is a paid uh, product. So it's going to sustain my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, and because it's paid, I'm going to spend more time making it good. I guess you stumbled across, uh, across um, a very important thing there, which is the cohort-based learning. It's great for accountability and success, right? I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot of cohort-based courses that pops up. Even platforms are being built just for this purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a big fan of it because you were asking me about the coding bootcamp. That was a cohort-based course, but mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. And somehow in the last couple of years, a lot of it became video courses, which is, which is nice, but a bit boring to watch the videos by yourself. So I'm a big believer that we're coming back to something maybe more hybrid, like you watch some kind of videos, but you still have some classmates doing it with you at the same time. Um, and I want to be part of that movement too. <laughs> You talk there about following your heart. You talk very much about being authentic, you know, and uh, reading between the lines. You have to really know yourself to be able to do that, yeah. right? Now, I don't know if you read, uh, have you, uh, if you've ever read Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I, I don't think I have. Okay. It's like, you know, it's, it's an old Chinese book and it's like, you know, they, they say it's great for like business and for, for, uh, it's a great strategy guide basically, right? It's mm. very metaphysical. Mm. Uh, and he talks about, you know, um, knowing yourself uh, before you know your enemy. That's very true. I think that's, that's one of my biggest learning as well is I have worked for eight years um, in the past and I always feel like I'm trying to copy someone. I'm trying to like reference someone's work and then do, do the same hack, you know, to, to get that uh, marketing tactic out or something. But end of last year, I when I zoom out a little bit, I was reading a lot of books. I was sitting down at a desk with a piece of paper and pen, thinking about who I stand for, what's my skill sets, what's my strength, what I want to do. I don't know, like that feeling of discovering myself is very powerful so that you can put yourself in a very unique position that no one can duplicate you, replicate you. And then you cannot be destroyed because you're so unique. <laughs> so I think people are talking about a term called personal monopoly. And, and I am also a believer in that. Like, yeah. How do you, how do people get better at, uh, like, what's your advice to me, let's say, on how mm -hmm. do I, how do I be more authentic? How do I discover my personal monopoly? Ooh, I think um, there's no easy way. It's basically getting rid of all the, electronics, <laughs> social media, oh, no. just, just spend time with yourself um, repeatedly. I don't think this is something that can be done in like one, one hour session. No, I, I 
since October 2020, I've been on this like indie journey, independent journey, right? And I think for the first 12 months, I was basically sitting down every two weeks with myself, thinking about what I learned in the last two weeks and what are people telling me uh, about what they like about me. And I think I only figured this out in February when the Building in Public Definitive Guide went so well. Then I was like, hmm, this is a good signal. This is a big part of my positioning, of my identity. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't know, just time for reflection. That's the three key words. Fantastic. Time for reflection. Beautiful. <laughs> Easy said than done. Oh yeah. Tell me about it. You have all your courses and I believe your, your uh, other website is publiclab.io. Is that the publiclab.co? Co. Okay, cool. That's where people can head to as well, uh, or your Twitter or your many other sites. That's right. Uh, yeah. What else are you working on right now? And is it all in public? Are you working on anything in private? Pretty much the private community, public lab and the 30 days in public challenge. That's the two things I'm working on right now. Um, everything is in public because, I mean, when I know that this strategy works so well, why do I need to work in private? <laughs> mm. That doesn't make sense. But maybe you're thinking, oh, Kavan, maybe you have some family business, some side projects. Maybe you're running a bar, a restaurant on the side. No, uh, I'm 100% dedicated to building public um, and the online world. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who can multitask. I need to put 100% of my focus. So this is what I'm doing. And you do also live your life in public to an extent. I mean, you're a very, <laughs> you're a very proud father of, of a young baby. And uh, you talk about that publicly quite a lot as well, don't you? Yeah, I'm not the kind of person that's scared of privacy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like bringing in your personal life is a next level to building your authenticity. Like, uh, at the end of the day, it's nice to know people from Twitter. But if you don't really know what they're doing in the daily life, that's a bit weird. Like you, you sort of know this person, but you don't. So yeah, I just, I just love sharing my personal life as well. Not too much though, because people might get annoyed by that, but just a little bit of doses here and there. So people know me more. This is, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time. This is really fun. I hope what I share is helpful to whoever is listening to this. I'm sure it will be. If nothing, it's been extremely helpful to me. You've given me lots of great ideas. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, But before I let you go, I need the jerk of the show. So I can tell you that I sold my vacuum the other day because all it was doing was collecting dust. Oh, (laughs) perfect. Oh, you know how, you know how many minutes I spend finding this joke? (laughs) It was pretty hard. (laughs) I'm sorry to put you through that, but it was totally worth it. That was beautifully terrible. (laughs) All right. right. Cheers. Thank you so much again. This has been wonderful. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'll speak to you soon. And that's all folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in. For more info, for questions, comments, or feedback, please head on over to aheadintech.com and don't forget to subscribe.